Good evening. Hello to our audience tonight. Uh, welcome to R7's second webinar of our spring season. Um, we're glad you're here with us tonight. We're going to give everyone 30 or 60 seconds to jump on this webinar um, and trickle in. We're using the Zoom webinar platform tonight. So just as a reminder to our audience as they join that they can go to the upper right hand corner of their screen to change the view settings of how they're um, experiencing our panel tonight and also start to familiarize themselves with that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. That's how we'll be taking in questions at the end of our session. Um, again, we're glad you're here and we're gonna get started in about 30 seconds. Welcome if you're just joining on the chat or on the webinar. We're uh, excited to uh, host this event tonight on a really important topic, mental health and supporting the mental health of our students, particularly during the summer months. My name is Katie Bergen. I'm the Executive Director of Public Relations for the school district and I will be your host tonight. We have a talented panel tonight of uh, experts, both within the LSR 7 school district and outside of the LSR 7 school district who are gonna share their expertise with us tonight um, and empower us with strategies for listening and supporting students who might be experiencing a mental health uh, challenge. Before I give you some information about our format and our panel, I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge something important. We know these kind of conversations can bring up different emotions or past experiences. So please take breaks tonight if you need them. If you or someone you know is in a crisis situation, please remember you can always call 888-279-8188 to get immediate support. Again, that number is 888-279-8188. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our panel tonight. Panelists, let's introduce ourselves. When I call your name, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your credentials. And let's stop, start with Kirsty Millar, who is a Suicide Prevention Program Manager for Rediscover, Rediscover Health. Good evening, everyone. Like Katie said, my name is Kirsty Millar. I run two suicide prevention programs at Rediscover. We've got a youth program that serves 10 to 24, an adult program that serves 25 and up. I also carry my therapeutic license and um, see a number of individuals for therapy as part of that program. Thanks for having me. And next we have Kristen Martinez with Burrell, Burrell Behavioral Health, who is the Director of Professional Learning. Hi, um, like she said, my name is Kristen Martinez. I'm the Director of Professional Learning for School-Based Services at Rural Behavioral Health. I've been in the mental health field for over 10 years and have worked with adults and youth and um, just love what I do. I get to go into schools and talk about mental health and that's what we're here to do today. So thank you for having me. Next, we have Michelle Hamilton, an LSR7 educational therapist. Hi, my name is Michelle Hamilton. I am a licensed professional counselor and registered art therapist. Uh, I am one of 12 educational therapists here in the Lee Summit School District. Um, I currently have three elementary schools, Richardson, Meadow Lane, and Underwood. Excellent. And finally, we have Dr. Allie Roberson, who is an LSR7 counselor. Hi, my name is Dr. Allie Roberson. I'm a counselor at Pleasant Lee in the Lee Summit School District. This would make about my 28th year in education. In the field of education, I've been a teacher, a facilitator, a speaker, a parent educator. And so now I am a counselor and I've been a counselor for over 10 years. Thank you, Dr. Roberson. So to, get, to, to kick us off tonight, uh, Kristen Martinez is going to put student mental health into some local and national context for us, and also give us some information about identifying mental health challenges in our young people. So I'm gonna turn the mic over to Kristen, and I'm also going to attempt to share our, my screen on the Zoom webinar. So Kristen, you feel free to take it away, and I will be sharing my screen shortly with our audience. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, there's a lot of things that you might not realize about mental health and um, our daily lives. Um, if you think about mental health, I want you to think about also your physical health. Let's say you fell down and broke your leg. Um, how long would you wait to get help? Um, would you wait 10 minutes, an hour, a few days, a couple of years? 
that doesn't sound normal. We wouldn't wait that long to go get help. Um, but the average time frame from when an individual starts to have um, symptoms of mental illness and actually receives intervention or help for that, the average is eight to 10 years. So when you think about it in the context of physical health, it, it seems like, no, nobody would wait that long. But unfortunately, mental health has kind of taken a back seat to our daily lives. And there's a lot of different reasons for that stigma and um, how we view mental health historically. Um, but I wanna talk about how important it is to really realize how prevalent, how, how much mental illness exists. Um, and just to kind of remind us all, we all have mental health, just like we all have physical health. So um, keeping in mind that context of we all have mental health and we all have physical health, we have to take care of those two things in order to be healthy and okay. So um, research says that one in five children struggle with a behavioral or emotional issue in the classroom. And we know if they're having emotional or behavioral issues in the classroom, they're likely having them at home too. Um, and 50% of all lifetime cases of mental illness begin by the age of 14. So that is pretty significant amount of people that are experiencing mental health symptoms or mental illness symptoms and um, are needing help. And so that eight to 10 years is a pretty significant amount for those individuals. Um, we see in 2021, so pretty recent statistics, um, almost 60% of youth with major depression did not receive any mental health treatment. So imagine 60% of children that broke their leg didn't go to the doctor and get that taken care of. Um, that wouldn't seem normal, would it? So um, unfortunately, we, we don't always pay attention to the, the need for mental health. And so um, I hope these statistics kind of show you not just some numbers, but these are people. These are kids that, that are needing help that potentially might not be getting it. 25% um, um, of overall um, for 6th to 12th grade students report feeling very sad in a survey from 2020, um, and that was in, within one month they felt that way. Um, and then it's, it's estimated that over 45,000 children and adolescents in Missouri are struggling right now with anxiety. That's a lot of kids, a lot of kids that are struggling. And so we want to make sure that we're paying attention to those, those kids that are having these struggles and getting them the help that they need, just like that kid that might have gotten hurt or been diagnosed with diabetes, they would need the help as well. So kind of comparing um, Missouri to a more national um, kind of landscape here. Um, so they did a survey in 2019 of high school students nationally, and we saw that the almost 37% experience persistent feelings of sadness and hopelessness. So that's out of every 100 kids in the high schools across the country, 36 of those students are experiencing feelings of persistent sadness and hopelessness. So quite a significant amount of kids. 18% um, of um, students seriously considered taking their own life, attempting suicide. Um, again, thinking about that one in five students are thinking about attempting suicide, or at least in 2019. Um, and unfortunately, we see these numbers continue to fluctuate and, and at times grow. So that's pretty concerning as well. 15% um, made a plan to die by suicide, and 8.9% attempted to die by suicide. Um, and then looking at Missouri um, for sixth through 12th grade, and that was in the school year 2018 to 2019, 11% of these students in Missouri had considered suicide during the past year, and almost 5% had actually made an attempt to die by suicide. Um, suicide is something that we want to take very seriously when we hear somebody talking about suicide. Um, it can bring up some uncomfortable feelings. Um, we may have experienced um, suicide in some manner. Um, statistically, um, it, we've probably been impacted in some way by suicide at some point in our lives. Um, and unfortunately, suicide carries stigma too, and individuals will often think that, well, they're just wanting attention, or they're not serious, or I don't want to bring it up, because if I bring it up, it's putting that idea in their mind. Um, all those things are myths. All those things um, that I just said are, are absolutely false. 
we know from research that if somebody is thinking about suicide and you ask them about suicide, they're more going to be relieved than angered. And it's more likely that um, the person that you're worried about asking if they're suicidal, um, if you're thinking that they might be suicidal, it's pretty likely that they're already thinking about suicide if you're concerned. So we want to take those things seriously. So we want to talk about some general warning signs. So some things to look out for in your child or teenager um, that kind of should set off a red flag, like something's going on with this kiddo. So if you notice a sudden or consistent fears, worries, even that perfectionism can be a sign that something might be going on. What, why are they trying to be so perfect? What are they worried could happen if they're not perfect? Um, if they're getting into fights, you're seeing an increase in aggressive behavior, um, maybe fights at school or in the neighborhood or with siblings. Emotional outbursts, um, either breakdowns or, like I said, anger, panicky behavior, changes in eating habits. Um, this could be less eating or more eating. Um, there's not just one, one specific way that people will behave. Um, the same goes for, for sleep. If, if somebody is struggling with depression, sometimes some people will sleep more, some people will sleep less. So poor concentration, um, this could be become hyperactive, impulsive with their behaviors. It could also look like disobedience. Um, maybe this is somebody that typically is obedient and suddenly we're having some challenging behaviors coming up and maybe they're shutting down. We're kind of seeing some concerning things here. Um, withdrawing, um, maybe they're dropping out of things. They wanted to be involved in the YMCA or sports and they're suddenly shutting down, <clears throat> withdrawing from these things, not wanting to participate anymore. Um, maybe they had a friend group and they're no longer in that friend group. I would be concerned, what, what happened there? What's going on? Um, clearly, if there's substance use going on, um, we want to check into that and, and try to see what's going on. Why are they turning to substances? Um, how can we get them connected to somebody that's going to help them overcome that challenge? Um, overly sexualized behaviors. Um, this could involve um, sexting, so sending messages of pictures of self or um, being inappropriate um, in person or digitally. Consistent physical ailments. Um, like I said at the beginning, um, we have to think about physical and mental health pretty similarly, and that's because they're actually pretty connected. Um, when you are feeling nervous um, or upset, you tend to have physical symptoms, don't you? You get a stomach ache, you might get a headache, you might get jittery, you might start sweating. There's all these kind of physical symptoms that will come up when we're having a mental challenge going on. Um, so it's important to pay attention to those. Um, during the school year, it could look like, um, you know, this stress and anxiety about school could look like stomach aches and, and headaches and not wanting to go to school because they don't feel good. Um, this might be actually indicating there might be something else going on. So we wanna check in on that and see what's going on. Um, during the school year, again, that tardiness absences um, and dur during the summer months, it might look like not wanting to get out of bed, um, not showing up where they're supposed to be. And then changes in academic performance. You know, usually this kiddo gets A's and B's and suddenly they have D's and F's. So what's going on? What are these challenges that they're facing that um, are causing them to, to struggle at this point? And then I wanted to kind of talk about the suicide warning signs, because like I said, we, we want to take these kind of things very seriously because um, it's not attention. Um, if somebody's talking about suicide, then they're thinking about it. And if they're thinking and talking about it, it's likely that they could potentially act on those thoughts and feelings. So we want to look at, um, are there changes in their physical appearance or hygiene? Is this somebody that usually takes care of themselves physically, um, does their hair, makeup, whatever, and suddenly they're not. We use the word unkempt. They're just not taking care of themselves. Their you know, hair is greasy, not showered, things like that. Um, again, we see the substance use creep in, um, drop in grades could be a potential sign. They're not just, they're just not caring anymore. Um, again, socially withdrawing, not wanting to connect with their peers or their friend groups that they used to, or their activities that they used to love to do so much. Um, like I said, talking about suicide, that preoccupation with death that could look like drawing pictures or 
verbalizing it, um, all those different kinds of things. And I just want to say really quick, um, oftentimes we think about um, suicide as something that maybe older youth think about and, and talk about and, and would attempt. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, as a therapist, um, unfortunately, I've worked with um, individuals and we've had um, losses of individuals that were as young as five and four years old. So we can't say that, well, my child is too young to be considering that um, it could be potentially something that they are thinking about. So we have to take it seriously and ask the question. Um, reckless behaviors, self-harming behaviors, these kind of things that show that they don't care about their physical self. If they're okay with harming their bodies through burning or cutting or different things, this means that they could potentially be more likely to attempt to hurt themselves um, more significantly in the form of trying to die by suicide. Um, and so they, you may find that um, they're researching, you, you find on their phone or on their laptop that they're searching up methods, um, how to die by suicide. And then talking about feelings of hopelessness and having nothing to live for. Um, there is a famous um, researcher that had um, somebody very close to him die and um, Thomas Joyner and he, did research about um, suicide and noted that individuals who feel hopeless and alone and have uh, that feeling of being a burden on their friends or family or even community are at a very increased risk for suicide. And if somebody's attempted to die by suicide previously, they're at an even higher risk because it didn't work last time. So now I know I have to do it this way. So again, we want to take those things very seriously. So um, if you encounter somebody that is struggling with suicide, be it um, your child, yourself, a friend, a neighbor, um, whoever that it might be, these are some good numbers to take down um, and to reach out for help. Um, so, you know, getting counselor, getting help would be at the highest, um, you know, of the list, but definitely making some phone calls if it is an immediate need for help. We have um, numbers for Arkansas, Central Missouri, which would be more you guys' section, um, that 1-800-395-2132. Um, and then for Southwest Missouri, we have that number as well. Um, if somebody is talking about um, they want to die right now um, and, and you're very concerned about their safety, it's time to call 911. It's time to get them to a hospital immediately. There is no, no time to wait there at all. We want to make sure that they're safe. And the best way to do that is to get them to a hospital and get them the care that they need. Um, and in some cases, calling the police um, can be um, the, the best way to do that because they may need, you may need somebody to be there. It may not be safe for you to put them in your car and try to take them to the hospital yourself. Thank you, Kristen. I think you just provided us with such valuable information about the general warning signs for a mental health challenge and, and obviously warning signs for suicide. And I think that's a really great segue for the first question that I have for all of our panelists, which is if a parent is concerned about their child, they're exhibiting any of the behavior that we just talked about, you know, where is the best place to start? And if you can provide, if our panelists, as I'm going to go through each of you, can put that a little bit into the context of summer as well, that would be helpful to our parents, I'm sure. So Kirsty, I'm going to start with you. You know, what do you tell parents and clients that you work with? If they're, if they have those concerns, what's the first thing or what are those first steps they should take? Sure. Let me first say, I, I don't know that I have a stock answer because it's going to vary by situation. So I want to first echo what Kristen just said, that there's a number of different resources. Um, I think it depends on how serious the scenario is. Obviously, if there's a need for medical intervention or like Kristen was just saying, if there is the immediacy of they're, they're articulating a plan and they're articulating access to that plan, immediate intervention needs to be happened. If, it, if it's safe to put them in a car and take them to a hospital to be evaluated, if the safety piece is questionable, reaching out to 911. The only thing I will add is that we do have um, CIT officers. It stands for crisis intervention trained. Your tax dollars are paying for it. They're specifically trained officers to be able to understand the mental health processes, to know what hospitals to transport to, to be able to kind of walk alongside you. Um, majority of the officers, if not all at this point, at least some that are CIT trained, but it's still okay to request that if you find yourself in that situation. 
um, shy of it not being that immediate and they're talking about it because let me also say that suicide is a bit on a spectrum um, and the way that I describe it to families is that just because someone sneezed and it sort of sounded like suicide does not mean immediate hospitalization needs to happen. Just because someone is struggling with not wanting to be here doesn't necessarily mean hospitalization. As a parent, it's a scary, scary, scary thing to hear from the human you created or the human you've taken on, the human you're raising. And so recognizing that help is out there, the numbers that Kristen shared or the number that Katie, you shared at the beginning um, is going to get you to the right direction, particularly over the summer. Calling that 888 number that was shared in the chat, I highly recommend um, because that is a local crisis line. It's staffed 24 seven, 365 with master's level clinicians and every single mental health center in the area partners with them. So um, Lee Summit area is going to be Rediscover that you're gonna be able to access that. Um, something that's not super public knowledge is that Rediscover does have on-call clinicians that work alongside those on-call um, or those crisis line staff. So should it mean that in the middle of the night, a provider needs to be deployed out to assist the officers, that does happen. It's gate kept by the crisis line, um, but it can be requested. And, and if we are requested, we are required to go. And everybody that functions on that team is also a master's level clinician. Calling Burl's crisis line, if that's the number you can remember, really just speaking to somebody and getting guidance. If you're not sure what to do and it's not that immediate need, my suggestion is always to call one of those crisis lines to get that guidance, to be able to say, okay, here's the situation. What do I do next? What are the resources? Because we panic, right? We panic when our, when our little one that we're worried about, whether they're little or a big little, are struggling. I think it's important to, to start with a professional when you can't think clearly for yourself. Um, I think it's okay to go that route. Michelle, I'm gonna go to you next. You know, if a parent is concerned about their child, particularly in that non-immediate, non-emergency situation, wh where do you recommend they start? So if it's over the summer months, um, a lot of parents like to start with their pediatrician, especially if it's a pediatrician that you have a long-standing relationship with that um, you, knows your child and knows your child's history, um, that can be a good place. Keep in mind, some offices can get you in quicker than others, um, but that's sometimes a resource that, that parents don't necessarily think of. Um, and pediatricians' offices are really good about partnering with the school district during the school year, um, especially if we're dealing with issues that are impacting academics or behaviors at school. Um, we're very, very lucky in our community to have um, Rediscover as our community mental health center, uh, as well as our new partnership with Burl. So we really have a lot of wraparound services there that we can make uh, referrals out to. But we also have a lot of um, different clinicians in the area that have access pretty immediately. Uh, you can contact any of the uh, offices that have um, like therapists with practices here. Also Children's Mercy is a really good uh, resource for help. The Children's Mercy nurse line, um, a lot of parents have that already programmed into their phone for like middle of the night crises numbers. If that's the only number you can remember, um, they will point you into the right direction uh, as well if you're not quite sure where to start. And Dr. Roberson, do you have anything to add about what you recommend to families? Yes, I do. Actually, I'm going to take a different spin on it. You know, many times we respond to um, high need situations or crisis when it happened. And what I really advise to many parents is if you are aware that right now that your kids have mental health concerns and there are behaviors, I suggest that you begin to plan, do some method, um, plan parenting. Unstructured time is not good for students who have some mental health concerns. Uh, making sure that they have activities, making sure they're very active, making sure there's structure, and making sure that there is some time where you as a parent and the child can build relationships, um, continue building the relationship, continue processing information and feelings, and also practicing those coping skills. Because at times, um, they don't have as much as stimuli and, um, and they don't have so much going on in their lives as they do during the academic school year. So there's a lot of time on their hands. You need to also monitor their social media. Make sure that you are very aware of what they are into, their peer relationships. There's a lack of social contacts or contact. They have, they're not engaged with their friends as much. 
So now there's this time where they are processing their thoughts and um, it's idle time. So you need to think um, very strategically and as a parent to plan activities to fill that up and also to build them up um, as individuals. Thank you, Dr. Roberson. Kristen, I wanted to ask you since um, you had gone through the general warning signs, you know, how can a parent differentiate between normal growing pains, I'm putting normal in quotes, and then, you know, red flags that you walked us through? Is there, is there a key or a process for evaluating that? Yes, um, that's a great point to bring up because um, there's normal development that happens when, you know, go through adolescence, different hormones are kicking in. There's going to be mood swings. There's going to be outbursts. There's going to be challenges that they face. Um, and it's not all a mental illness. Um, and so we need to, um, keep an eye on those things and see if this is a pattern that's evolving, because as we talked about, you know, 50% of lifetime cases start at 14. And so if you have somebody that's around that age group and you're noticing a pattern of behaviors and a pattern of these red flags kind of going off, that is when it's time to connect with the resources that um, the, Michelle and, and Ali mentioned and Christy. Do any of my panelists wanna, um add more to that question? I'll just add on to, oh, sorry, Michelle. Go ahead. I'll just add on to what Kristen was just saying. I agree with Kristen on top of, I also don't think there's ever a wrong time and I'm sure the panelists would agree in having this conversation and asking those questions. If you're noticing a shift in your kid, it's okay to say, hey, I've noticed this. Are you thinking about hurting yourself? Are you struggling mentally? Are you sad a lot? Are you anxious? Are you thinking about suicide? We live in a society where that stigma is, if we ask it, we're giving the idea, but to throw more statistics at you, statistically speaking, minimally, if we are worried about somebody in our world thinking about suicide, they've thought about it a minimum times of four to seven in that window. So actually having that conversation is gonna open up the conversation and lower that risk of an impulsive act. So never, never, never is the wrong time to have that conversation, recognizing too, that you know your kid best and to probably expect a little bit of pushback or I'm fine. And, and maybe that's the time to engage in the resources on how to navigate that conversation, but definitely look for the patterns. However, trust your gut. I wanted to say that it's very important that you um, first recognize how you think about situations in your own mental health, because many times, according to the ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences, our children learn patterns of behavior from us. They, they learn how to brush their teeth. They learn what to do or how to express their emotions. And I think that it's very important that you first tap into how you model handling situations and expressing your emotions. And that also, if you model expressive language using emotional language, using I am upset, I am angry, um, I feel sad, then children will also have that um, vocabulary to use expressive language. We have to input into our daily living schedules, um, time and opportunity and the freedom to express the emotions. So I think, yes, be very aware of the patterns of behaviors, but also know the difference between what's healthy and unhealthy. Know the difference between, um, listen to their conversations and hear the um, self-talk, if it's positive or negative, um, have talks about their self-image so that you are getting to the mindset of your child because um, there are times when children, and this to be realistic, like my child, my child does behave very similarly to me. But how el however, if I'm unhealthy, I'm gonna think, oh, he or she is okay. The other thing is to have compassion and be my, very mindful that children are different now. So the resilience that we had or as parents is not the same type of resilience now. There is an overwhelming and alarming rate of hopelessness. Um, research states that children have this rate of hopelessness. And with social media and isolation and the lack of family um, gatherings and activities, and we're just coming off of COVID, then 
you need to be very aware of how your child operates, what's healthy, what's unhealthy, as well as what are some of the behaviors that I have displayed. And if those are really appropriate coping skills, what worked for you may not work for them. So have that compassion that today's youth is very different than yesterday's. Kristen and Michelle, I wanna wrap you into this. You know, I think this is a good segue into just in general, what are strategies for starting that conversation with your child and having a difficult dialogue or maybe not having a difficult dialogue? Um, Kristen, do you wanna go first? Sure, absolutely. So like they're saying, the other panelists are saying, it's important to have um, an awareness of yourself and to open up that conversation honestly and create a safe environment for your child to feel like they can speak freely with you about their challenges. Um, you know, I, I'm a mother as well. And, um, you know, I've had moments where I've become concerned about my kids, um, you know, feelings that maybe they're having episodes where they're crying or had a panic attack. And so I'm paying attention to that. And I'm talking with them and asking them, Hey, are you okay? What's going on? What is bringing this on? Um, so being curious and, and having open-ended questions where you can get more information is really, really important. And, putting your phone down, <laughs> giving them complete attention um, because they're important. If, if again, going back to the um, physical piece, if they had fallen and broken their leg, would you be on your phone? Like, okay, so uh, how, how, how are you doing? We would not. And so mental health is just as important. So we want to take our attention and put it fully on our child and ensure that we're giving them proper eye contact. We are engaging with them verbally. Okay. Yes. Thank you for sharing that with me. Um, just all those kind of things are so important to ensure that they feel heard number one, and that they feel comfortable continuing to share with you. And they may not want to share, like somebody mentioned, they, they may not be ready to have that conversation, but knowing that you're available and open to having that conversation, that is what's most important. Um, leaving those lines of communication wide open and then checking on them. Hey, you know, are you, how are you doing today? What can I do for you? Are you ready to have that talk? Are you ready to maybe have a talk with somebody else? Would you like me to get you connected to some help? Michelle, what strategies do you uh, recommend when starting that conversation with students? I love what Kristen had to say. I think um, as parents, a lot of times we try to talk at our kids um, or like what Ali was saying, we want to say, well, when I was your age, this worked for me. Um, and that might not be where they're at or what they want to hear. Um, I'm a huge fan of Dr. Bruce Perry. And one of the um, things that he talks about a lot is the idea that when a kid is dysregulated and they're upset, that is not the time to have the discussion. That is not when their brain is in a place that they're really gonna hear anything that we have to say. And they can't even really think very clearly um, in order to articulate their feelings. So what he says is the three R's and it's regulate, relate, and reason. So regulate, that could be any kind of activity. Sometimes it's a hug. Sometimes it can just be, I am here for you, or let's take some deep breaths. Let's go for a walk around the neighborhood. Let's just do something. We're not gonna talk about it. We're just going to try to get ourselves relaxed. That kind of then goes into the relational piece of that. So the, the relate piece, do something either together, do um, just show that, you, that you're that you there to listen and that you care. And then you can go to that, that reasoning place where you can say, hey, I really noticed that you were upset earlier. Is there something that you would like to share with me? Um, or I've noticed maybe you haven't been hanging out with your friends as much lately. Is there something going on? Um, like what Kristen stated with the open-ended questions, we, we just really need to be more intentional about the time that we have with our kids. I find I am rushing from one activity to the next. I pick kids up from school and then we're running to soccer and then we're trying to pick up dinner on the way. So I try to use those opportunities when we're in the car um, to have some of those conversations um, or at nighttime, uh, kind of when everybody's sort of like calming down, we've um, had some you know craziness of the evening, but things are, are a little bit more calm, just kind of building those things in throughout the day. 
during the summer, uh, if you have any of those kind of unscheduled times, if you can use some of that time to have some of those conversations, maybe doing a morning check-in, um, checking in throughout the day is really important, especially if your kids um, are staying home by themselves um, or have a lot of that idle time, kind of like, hey, how are you doing? You know, what's going on today? Um, I think it's just important to really be, be active in our kids and really create opportunities for conversation with them because as we know, um, they're not necessarily gonna do that on their own. Well, I'd like to add something. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Just to kind of wrap in what all three of our other wonderful panelists have already said, I also think there's a time when nobody's dysregulated but a parent and it's okay to call attention to, I, I'm a mom, but I'm a mom of a toddler. And so I'm in the phase of I'm narrating everything I do, including when I'm having a bad day. And I think as she gets older, my hope would be man, mom's had a rough day today. When I've had a rough day, I really like to go for a run. What do you like to do when you've had a rough day? And kind of using those open-ended questions, but also like Ali was saying earlier, representing that I have bad days too, that I'm human and that it's normal and okay. And here's a healthy way that I take care of that. So it's, it's kind of that mentality of here's what worked when I was young, but and instead, here's what works for me as a mom. Here's what I need and, and what happens. And it, I can say that even when they've not had a bad day, because my bad days aren't always the same as my kids' bad days. And so I think it's important to just remember back to when they were toddlers and you were narrating everything and kind of take that approach too. Um, because I do think, I forget who said it, and I'm so sorry, but we do get caught up in just responding to the crisis, but recognizing that our crises are not their crises and that it, it's okay to feel sad sometimes. And just because we're sad, doesn't mean anything other than we're sad. I think as a society, something I have learned again in having a toddler is they're sad and our immediate reaction is to make them feel better. And I've really tried to just, she's got to sit in it. It's okay to be sad or she's mad at me. She's not hurting me. She's not doing anything. And even training my parents or my husband, like, you know, I'm the therapist mom. And so I get, I get that a lot, but recognizing that emotions are okay and are normal and that every emotion means that there has to be an intervention. And so recognizing that too, and just kind of wrapping up what all of these wonderful ladies have already said, I think is important. I can add one more thing to add. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, and she, she touched on something. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll keep it quick. She touched on something. She said that not every emotion needs like um, a huge response. And we live in a society where we want a quick fix. We want a microwave fix. And we do have to show the continuum that it's okay to have an emotion. I know when I go to classrooms, we talk about emotions, we identify the emotions, and we say it's okay to have an emotion so that a small emotion where you can sit with it and then it doesn't have to be blown up. And I think if we began that, then that builds resilience for kids to say, I'm not okay right now, as well as to help them understand that one bad moment doesn't mean a bad day it's okay to have a bad moment and so then we can turn it around we can make choices to have a good day and we have to begin to put that in their toolbox that's a coping skill in itself just to be expressive to identify emotions and and know that every emotion it's a natural emotion so because I'm sad doesn't mean I'm depressed I'm sad and, and distinguish between what needs attention and what needs, um, what is a, a perfect opportunity, a learning opportunity to practice that resilience. I'm sorry. No, that was great. And honestly, I think I do wanna ask this question now, you know, when we talk about coping skills and processing emotions, you know, we know that in the summer months, some of the things that might happen um, that impact our students could be current events or national things or local things, things that might not have a direct impact on our students, but still impact them nonetheless. So what, and this list question is for anyone, you know, what advice would you give to parents to support students through something like that? You know, those big stressors or events that might impact them over the summer months. I'm leaving it up oh, to know. whoever wants to jump in. Go ahead, Michelle. I can, I can ahead, jump Michelle. in. Um, I, I think, you know, we have over the last couple of years had uh, quite a few very large major events. Um, and it's important, one, to consider child's developmental level, the conversation that you're going to have with 
a kindergarten or first grader is going to be much different than a middle school or high school student. Um, don't assume that they know everything. Just kind of go into the conversation asking questions about finding out what do they know, um, maybe what have they heard from their friends. Um, I like to try to encourage parents to really just kind of follow their lead. Similarly to the conversation um, earlier, really just asking open-ended questions, you know, what have you heard about what's going on? You know, how does that make you feel? Um, is there anything um, you want me to know about, you know, how you feel or, or what you've heard at school um, or from the news? Trying to limit some of the exposure to, um, to news, which is is hard because we don't really get the news from turning the TV on anymore. We get it from social media and, and every place else. Um, but I think being really honest with our kids about our feelings, um, being honest about their feelings and kind of keeping it brief too. I don't think we need to talk at them and give them big giant explanations um, or going super in depth, unless that's your child and they're older and they they need some of that. Um, but yeah, just trying to have some of those those conversations with them um, and checking in regularly. What I was gonna say is um, interesting that you have this question because I had this chat with my daughter just yesterday. And with so many war worldwide events happening, it was a perfect opportunity for me, just like Michelle said, to ask her, what does she think for her to express her thoughts? But more importantly, what I really ended with was, what can you control? Control what you can control. And know that you know it's a wonderful opportunity for you to um, one, understand your own philosophy and what you think in your ideology, Two, it helps them begin to framework their morals and what they're going to stand for. And then especially for older kids, and I would say, you know, from the age 10 on, this is a wonderful opportunity to say, well, you know, what's a way that you can solve it? And, and very quick, it doesn't have to be an in-depth think um, in depth conversation, but there's two reasons why I say this. Number one, it helps them practice be a problem solver. And number two, it always helps them to be optimistic and looking to the future. And we need future leaders, but we need to give them that opportunity for them to see themselves and the future solving problems. And so when you say, well, what what's the way you could solve it? It helps their own mind practice that skill without you really saying solve the problem, but it keeps them in line with control what you can control right now. Mm -hmm. I'll just add echo really what they both said, but also add permission that as parents, we don't have to have the answers. I think a lot of the times, especially with what's going on, we want to have answers and we want to encourage our kids to respond how we might or the opposite of how we might because we know more than they do in terms of a lot of the times what's going on in the world. And so recognizing that it's okay to say, I don't know, it's okay to say, this makes me scared, or it's okay to say, we're going to ride this out together. I think Dr. Robertson is absolutely correct that we have to raise those critical thinkers and what can you control? And so then leaning into that, here's what I control. I can control this about how I feel. And really, again, narrating and modeling, modeling that behavior goes a long way but recognizing that we are human and that these kids did not come with, um, you know, the age old joke of they didn't come with a manual, but they really didn't. And so we're doing the best that we can. And like was already mentioned earlier, we're kind of accidentally raising many, but hopefully better versions of ourselves. And so it's okay to accept the, I don't know, and the unknown, but as a society, we're not good at that. So sitting in that is powerful. I just want to add one last thought that has been on my mind since the previous conversation, um, talking about, you know, when to have those conversations with your kids, when you are upset, when you're not in your best self, it's probably not a good time to have these difficult conversations with your kid. Um, maybe you're not even the right person sometimes to have difficult conversations. Maybe it's going to be, you know, uncle Joe, cause he really has a great bond and can really talk to some things that maybe you might be uncomfortable with, or you don't know how to navigate, or they just have this bond. Um, but sometimes it's just important for us to be aware of ourselves and take a deep breath, take some time, 
get a drink of water. And you're in a sense, like we've talked about the panelists have been talking about modeling this to your kid, you know, hey, I'm feeling dysregulated, upset, whatever word you want to use, and I need a break. And um, I really want to talk to you about this. It's really important to me, but I need to calm down first so that I can be fully here with you. Absolutely. I do want to get to uh, one of our questions from the audience. As a reminder to our audience, uh, you can submit a question through the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, uh, from one parent, I like the idea of being able to have a conversation with my student. How do I know, though, when it's time to get them professional help? And I'll open that to whoever wants to jump in first. I kind of feel like Christy talked to this um, kind of already, like it's never a wrong time to get professional help. Um, if you're concerned, it's definitely the right time. Um, but it, you know, a counselor, having somebody that uh, your child can go to and talk to and, and learn some coping skills, it is never a wrong time <laughs> to do so. Um, as soon as I noticed, you know, one of my kids struggling with anger or an anxiety attack, I'm going to be calling a counselor and, and trying to get them the skills that they need because I can't be my own kids counselor. I'm a counselor, but I can't be my own kids counselor. They need somebody outside of me they can go to and talk freely and be able to get the help that is going to give them the skills and, and things that they need in order to, to regulate themselves. I'll, I'll echo her echoing me. <laughs> um, just to echo her again, that in her presentation, she talked about, and we're going to confuse you more because our names are super similar. Um, but Kristen talked about in the beginning, you know, that, that large population of people who are lifetimers who don't get treatment right away. Um, and I, I wanna echo too that what she's already said that I mentioned earlier, there is no right or wrong time, but that also goes for us as parents. If we feel out of control or dysregulated as a parent, as a support person for a young person, like she's already mentioned, all of us are, are seasoned um, mental health professionals, but we can't be our children's counselors and we can't be our own counselors as much as we probably all would like to be. So it's also okay to check in on I need support. I'm really feeling frustrated or I'm finding myself dysregulated with this conversation. I know that's not what the question was, but I think we've already kind of alluded to the whole system really matters. And we live in a world where seeking help isn't simple. However, if you broke your leg, you'd get help for yourself. You'd get help for your child. It's, it's no different here. And I just want to validate that there's no right or wrong time for you as a parent to also get that support. Well, that's the perfect segue because we have another question, which is, you know, what strategies do you give parents for their own self-care? And I would imagine all of our panelists maybe have thoughts on this. So um, uh, Dr. Roberson, do you want to kick us off and we can go do a round robin on that one? You know, we live in a fallacy or our world has told us that we should balance it all, that we should be superhumans. And so number one, give yourself a break. That's one, give yourself some grace and know that we don't have to live in a balance. You don't have to have a balanced life, but think of it more of as a symphony that there are parts of your life and as if you compare it to instruments, some instruments speak very, um, play very loudly while others are quiet and they need that attention at that particular time. But to um, know that there are areas of your life that you're really gonna pay a lot of attention to, and guess what? It's also okay to let something slip. Be forgiving of yourself, making sure you take time for yourself, plan it, plan the time. And do something very simple. Now, I like massages, but I also know that I can't always have massages. So I plan something very simple, whether that means that I go for a walk, whether that means that I go to McDonald's and get that ice cream and sit there and enjoy it. Make myself stop and enjoy it. And so, um, and also, I think you need to um, pay attention to your body your body tells you what you need, don't ignore it, as well as you have got to be kind to your body, as well as tell people how to treat your body. And we've echoed over and over to say, mommy's having a bad day. That right there is a simple step of a mental, um, of taking care of yourself that you are admitting that I'm having a bad day. And um, I tell my kids all the time, I love you too much to fail. I love you too much to fail, but I also got to love me enough. 
Because if I'm not good to myself, I'm not good for anyone else. So sometimes I put the posting on the, um, on the bathroom door, mommy time, take time out for yourself. And I know that's hard, but carve it out. And so just love on yourself, pay attention to your body. Um, and then also show yourself some grace and forgiveness. Kristen, do you want to go next? Sure. I was just like loving everything that you were saying, Dr. Robertson. It's, it's just absolutely true. Like you have to plan it. You have to be purposeful and you have to give yourself permission to do so. Um, like you said, I just want to echo, like we get wound up in our lives. We have work, we have kids, we have, if we're in school, whatever things that we're going through and, and working on, and that's not even encompassing, like issues and challenges, physical, mental, you know, relationship, all these other things, um, then we're just spent and, and our day is over. And so it's so important for us to think about what gives me life, what makes me feel alive and gives me energy, what re-energizes me. Um, there's this quote that I found that I thought was really cute. Almost everything will work again if you unplug it for a few minutes, including you. <laughs> So, you know, what are you doing to unplug? And that doesn't mean just your cell phone, but yes, please your cell phone, <laughs> you know, take some time to plan, plan a vacation, plan a walk. It doesn't even have to be something expensive or, or have a price tag attached to it. Go to the park, feed the ducks, anything that you can do to disconnect from all the things, all the noise and, and reconnect with, with nature, with the things that make you feel alive and, and feel full. Michelle or Kirsty? Uh, so I, I think unplugging is is really important. Um, we live in an age where kids are seem to be connected twenty four seven. We seem to be connected twenty four seven. And I know it sounds really scary to maybe go on a walk without your phone, but we can do it. Um, going outside um, and spending time outside is really important as well. Um, we have lower vitamin D levels um, as, as a population now than we, than we ever have. We don't get to spend as much time outside um, and that can be really energizing for people. And just knowing that you know we're modeling good self-care for our kids. And so when they see us taking care of ourselves, when they see mommy time on the post-it, they're like, oh, mom's going to take care of herself. Maybe I should go take care of myself. Um, or even encouraging little breaks throughout the day. If you see that somebody, uh, one of your kids is frustrated um, or your partner is frustrated, like, hey, why don't you go take five or 10 minutes, go do something that you enjoy. I think the other piece is really relying on your on your lifelines, your support people. Um, if you're really stressed out, and see if you can, you know, ask your partner to um, take time to go get that massage, um, to go on the walk. I have little kids that need me um, kind of 24/7, so it's it seems to be really hard to kind of find the time sometimes. But we have to be able to ask for it. And by doing that, we're modeling to our kids also that it's okay to ask for what you need. Um, and then hopefully they'll go to school and other, you know, other areas and ask for what they need to. Like, I'm, I, you know, I'm not having the best day. Maybe I need to go take a few minutes. Add quickly. Absolutely. I echo what everybody said as per usual. Um, but really just stressing what's like tumbling through my head is take a day off. And I, I need to probably hear my own advice. And I recognize too, I want to validate that not everybody has that luxury to take a day off and truly get paid for it. But what I mean is even what Dr. Robertson was saying, Robertson, geez, I threw a T in there. So sorry. Um, but take a day off from the laundry. It can wait a day. Take a day off from the dishes. I think we've already mentioned we live in a society. And if you're anything like me, COVID did a number on, I'm now working from home and I can see all of my housely duties that are just stressing me out because they're not done. On top of, I have these humans I have to care for. I have these fur animals I have to care for. And so take a day off, whether it's you have the capability to do that from your job and don't tell anybody, don't tell your partner, don't tell your kids, go get that massage, go sit in the sun. If you don't have that luxury, the laundry can wait a day. The dishes, they'll be there tomorrow. Take a day off where you can give yourself that space to breathe. We do have a valuable question in the chat about empowering our children to witness or maybe 
tips for experiencing someone else's mental health crisis. So the question is, while talking to our children, how do we tell them to navigate or watch someone who may have a mental disorder or is having a mental breakdown or is just experiencing a mental health challenge, I imagine, and, and who do they tell? Um, and so I'm gonna open that up to the panel. I think it's a good idea to open those conversations up and let them know that, you know, this is important and, and that is awesome that you're noticing these things about your friend. That means you really care and you're a great friend. Those things are so important to validate, number one. And then who's an, a trusted adult, positive caring adult that you could connect this kiddo to and get them the help that they need? Um, I have experienced um, kids who feel like they have to take on that friend's troubles and want to resolve it for them or help them fix it that's not your job. Your job is to be a kid and to enjoy your life. Um, you can get your friend help by connecting them to an adult who is somebody capable of handling and helping that kiddo. That is never going to be your responsibility to do. That's too much of a, a burden or whatever you want to call it. It's too heavy of a load to carry for a kid. Kristen took my answer, but I will add, I know it's okay. It's a good answer. Um, <laughs> I will add and lean into what she said in terms of notice she said adult. She didn't say parent, she didn't say, and I know as parents that's hard to hear, but encouraging a trusted adult in their world, whether that's the pastor, the coach, whether that's you as the parent, it's their best friend's cousin's brother. It doesn't matter what she's saying is so true. Empower and validate that, heck yeah, you saw that in your friend and you know that that's worrisome behavior now, who are we gonna go tell? Um, and recognizing that it was mentioned even earlier, sometimes we're not the people they're going to come to. This is where I unfortunately have to inform you, we're not cool now that we're parents and it really sucks, but we want, we want to build their village and, and knowing that they're going to lean on somebody is, is incredibly empowering for me, knowing that my little one has a number of people to go to if I'm not available and or I'm not the right person. I think the empowerment comes from one, recognizing that that is a trauma for someone. It helps build compassion for others. And as parents, we want to shield them from all the negativity in the world, but newsflash, they see it everywhere. I mean, we have TikTok, Instagram that is constantly um, spreading messages about how they feel and the trauma and, and that individuals have gone through. And so I think that they're gonna see it and I think the empowerment comes from that one, they can recognize how they feel about it, express how they feel about it. And like I said before, control what you can control and the things that you can't control, like all the great panelists said, have one, two, three people that they can go to, to relinquish that I can't control this. Let me give it to someone who is trained to control this. You know, so that's empowering to say, I like, you know, I'm sad because my friend is sad. Great. That shows compassion. Now that you're sad because your friend is sad, where does the help come from? And recognizing that, nope, I need to, I need to go to Michelle. I need to go to Kirsten. I know I need to go to Kristen or Kirsty or Katie. That's where that empowerment comes from. And I think telling, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, encouraging your student to know that they are not um, breaking their friend's trust by getting them help. I think so many times the piece that is missing is that the student feels that they're going to irreparably damage their friendship by seeking out assistance from an adult. Um, the, the adults can navigate that situation to say, you know what, somebody that cares about you came to me and expressed that, you know, maybe you're not feeling so good. They don't have to call them out by name. So by, by letting an adult know, it's actually in your friend's best interest. We're almost at time and I wanna be respectful of our audience time, but I also wanna make sure that um, each of you has one last opportunity to share a resource or a tool that you would recommend um, our audience members check out or look into. We gotta be succinct here. I wanna make sure that we send people on their way into their evening, um, but let's just do a quick round robin. If there was a website, a resource, a tool that you would wanna make sure that our audience knows about, what would that be? And Kirsty, we'll start with you. 
I just want to first say thank you for your time tonight. I know that time is valuable and delicate and you've taken the time to spend it with us and I very much appreciate it. Um, what I will share is Rediscover's website. Um, simply rediscover the letter M like mental, the letter H like health.org. It's going to have a plethora of information. It's going to have all of the services that we have, all of the direct phone lines, all of the locations, um, all that you need to know, as well as a link to request contact. If you have further questions, that's monitored during business hours um, by our marketing team, and then they get it to the right program if there are further questions. So that's what I will share just because I only have time for that. Dr. Roberson. I'm going to still and say that LSR district does have a wonderful website that you can go ahead and tap into and one powerful resource yourself. Trust your instincts. Excellent. Uh, Michelle? Um, so within the, um, the district website are two resources that your educational therapist team maintain. Um, the first is called the Community Resource Guide, um, and that is all of our local mental health organizations, and it, it, it really runs the gamut of, of all services from um, food pantries and local organizations that can help with with pretty much everything. And we have a shortened version that is our summer resource guide um, to um, help families access summer resources as well. And finally, Kristen. So um, Burl has a great resource that's online every week um, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays called Be Well. So if you go to um, your Facebook and you pull up um, Burl and look up Be Well, this is a great resource. It's about tapping into your mindfulness and mindfulness is just about paying attention in the present moment and on purpose so that you can connect with yourself, your body, your surroundings. Um, and then um, the National Suicide Hotline, um, 1-800-273-8255. You can Google it if you need to, um, but um, that is a great resource to just talk to somebody. It doesn't have to be there, you know, doing something right now. That would be 911. Um, but if you you're just needing to talk to somebody you're concerned that is a great line for you to call or if your child or a friend or neighbor whoever might be needing it 1-800-273-8255 and you can also text 741-741. I'll just add a tidbit really fast to her resource that maybe you don't know Kristen is actually if you call that national line and you have a, a local area code, it's actually gonna to roll to the local crisis line because they are a subsite of that national crisis line. So I know sometimes I've had families who are like, I don't wanna call a national line, I'm not getting somebody local. But in fact, shy of those of you that don't have local phone numbers, you actually will be routed to the to the most nearest, it's not the right terminology, but the nearest um, subsite of, of your area code. So if you have 816-660 or I believe 913, you, you route to this area. I wanna thank each and every one of you for the excellent information that you provided uh, to our audience tonight. Audience, if we did not get to, our quest to your question, we do have your question uh, recorded and we can reach out to you privately. We also have shared a lot of resources tonight and we have your emails from when you registered for the webinar so we can follow up with links to those resources and we will be able to do that this week. I want to thank our audience for devoting time and being interested and invested in this topic. Um, our webinar series is something we plan to continue next school year. And so we appreciate you guys being part of a new communication practice here in the district. I hope you guys have a pleasant night. And again, thanks to our panel. Take care, everybody.